Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. Still wrapped in a pandemic. Sometimes in parts of the United States, it doesn't feel that way, but in other parts of the United States, it's certainly that way. And still for the majority of the planet, which remains unvaccinated, we are in a, uh, in a uh, permanent state of pandemic until uh, lots of things change. It's also an overheating planet, as uh, anyone who's followed my work for the decades uh, understands, and not to mention the work of the Columbia Climate School and, and realities around the planet. You, you don't have to be a scientist anymore to know that there's um, uh, shifts and extremes. And the uh, upper end of these registers are places that we really don't thrive well in, and particularly the most vulnerable among us. I'm Andy Revkin. Um, this is the Sustain What webcast of Columbia Climate School. Today, we're going to talk again about heat. We did a session earlier in the year when Portland and Seattle in that area was uh, going through scorching time. And then like now, we're going to focus on uh, the role of communication and driving progress and uh, reducing vulnerability for those uh, most at risk. Um, and we're going to focus on both science and journalism. And what's really interesting to me is that there's this um, evolution of newsrooms toward bringing scientists into the process of sifting data and and uh, looking for ways to visualize it and, and to connect it with the society. So social science, physical science, and journalism, we're all probing for reality, right? So there's a lot of common uh, motivation. We have different traditions about uh, you know how we talk to sources, but this feels like a really uh, interesting experiment. And today uh, we've got uh, a couple of people coming on. Uh, Brian Howard, Howard, right? Uh, Edward. Who is, oh, Edwards. I'm so sorry. It, this, we pulled this together quickly. Uh, who is part of a collaborative, and that's another trend in journalism. It's not every every outlet doing its own thing, uh, and doing a true collaboration, including in this case, the, the Columbia Journalism School has an investigations um, unit, um, and NPR and other um, uh, outlets got together. Uh, we'll explore your work. And Cascade Tuholsky, is it Tuholsky? The, how do you pronounce yeah, your last Tuholsky name? Yeah, Tuholsky or Tuholsky. We've Tuholsky. never really known in the family, so. Uh, interesting. Uh, who is a uh, scientist who's just uh, coming to the Earth Institute, to uh, the climate school uh, at, at CSIN. And you can, you can uh, disentangle that acronym. We're just surrounded by acronyms here. Uh, and, and what you've done is take these great databases uh, and sifted them and found very disturbing patterns of exposure to the hazard we call extreme heat. Uh, we're basically, the world is moving into hot zones almost as quickly as hot zones are expanding. And, and that creates multiple sources of the problem. But of course, that means there's lots of things to do about it, to cut exposure. And I just see waking up early in the, uh, on the hot, smoky West Coast is Tony Barbosa at the LA Times. Uh, great that you could join us. You guys uh, have been doing epic reporting on heat as well. And uh, just was just yesterday um, uh, unveiled a very disturbing uh, portrait of uh, undercounting or underestimation of mortality from heat in California. And we'll get into that as well. And I will say at the very start that uh, the last thing I like to do on the show is have all guys, all white guys. <laughs> But here we are. Uh, once in a while, it's almost unavoidable to have uh, patterns emerge, uh, you know, statistically. And some of our colleagues who are uh, female or couldn't be on with us today. But this is going to be a, an exciting and quick look at some important frontiers. Tony, I was just saying, uh, there's this shifting tradition. You know, it used to be that we all reporters would call up a scientist who's done a paper and ask her, you know. What are the important findings? You talk to some other scientists and kind of say, well, is this, is this new or novel or, or is this uh, flawed? And and now science is increasingly getting into the newsroom. And I think it, you know, it, it comes with some questions, uh, it, but it also comes with really big opportunities. So those are the things we're going to explore. Um, I just hold on one second while I click through. I, I do also like to say, especially because uh, Monday is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, in, uh, in the United States, um, you know, that the landscape of Columbia University and the Hudson Valley where I live uh, is, here's an aerial view, is, um, has a long history of peoples before we mapped it. This is like the modern map, you know, Poughkeepsie, I'm in Cold Spring there, 
climate school in the uh, Lamont Doherty or down the river. Um, and this is a nativeland.ca, great map resource. It's like Google Maps for history. And you take away the modern labels and you see that we're on a landscape of with deep history and uh, traditions that that some of which are still very live, alive and well around us. But here we go. So I thought we'd start with some science. Um, and, and thank you both, uh, uh, Brian and, and Tony, for being here too. Uh, just this week also in PNAS, uh, uh, Cascade was a lead author, I believe, on a really important paper that takes us through um, around the world to zones where you're getting, as I said, heat is expanding both through climate change and through the spread of things like asphalt and concrete. But it, the exposure to heat is, is expanding way faster as these big cities, whether it's Lagos or Phoenix, uh, grow, the communities grow. And when you have poverty uh, laced in there, people without air conditioning, people who are forced to work outside, that that, that creates a really intense uh, risk map. So, so Cascade, could you just describe your work a little bit and how you dug in on this? And you may have to yeah, unmute. I, I can if I can unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. so this study um, was a culmination of uh, three years worth of work. And I really just want to give credit to my collaborators and co-authors. It really was a team, team effort. And just along the lines of scientists and journalists collaborating, scientists collaborating across disciplines, I think I'm part of a new generation of scientists where silos truly are broken down. and. Um, I think Columbia Climate School is really the next step in that direction. Um, so in in short, what we did is we counted uh, every urban person on the planet um, or used a data set that does that. And we multiplied that by how many days per year e uh, each city is exposed to extreme heat. Um, so our metric is person days and then just measure the trend line where person days are going up. Um, but I got to I got to I got to put you on pause for a second. You counted every urban person in the world. That sounds like, let's untangle that tiny, tiny bit. Yep. How does that happen? So, so um, it's really, when I started grad school, I was, I was very interested on, uh, to learn about cities. And it blew my mind that we don't actually, uh, until recently, have a very good inventory of how many cities there are, much less those cities labeled, much less how many people live in them. And so um, season, where I work here at Columbia University, um, for a long time has been building these gridded population products where they take census data and then they grid it. So they, they inventory the best available census data and then they equally allocate people to a grid cell. They teamed up with the European Union who took uh, Landsat satellite imagery that mapped impervious surface. So where we think there's built environment and then they use uh, an algorithm to allocate people to uh, where they think people actually live rather than just um, equally allocating them across this, uh, grid cells. And then they apply another special uh, smoothing algorithm to delineate dense built up areas as quote unquote cities. And I don't know how they attached all the labels to the cities, but that in itself mm -hmm. is a huge effort. So that's, yeah, that's how the urban data set is built. And there's definitely, um, you know, it's an estimation, so it's not exact. And the word urban itself uh, among urban scientists is, um, it means different things to different people. And I think that's really important for the broader public to understand is cities doesn't just mean Los Angeles or uh, Lagos or Missoula, Montana, where I'm from. It can mean very different things to, to different people. And, and what's interesting about this is, um, of course, one of the questions you face is uh, countries that are poor or have, don't have a, you know, functioning governance might not have the data to begin with. So there, you have what's called a street light effect, both in journalism and in, and in science sometimes, where you sort of look for the, you know, that's the looking for the keys under the street light phenomenon where we can miss, uh, there can be big gaps, I guess. So is that more fillable now than it was? Yeah, and I think the, the next step, which, um, you know, uh, Brian's work and Tony's work, um, and I just uh, was reading the LA Times piece this morning, but that's the next step in terms of a global top-down analysis as actually mapping, you know, making sure no one's left off the map, especially those who are vulnerable or at the country level, countries that don't have the resources to map their populations and identify who needs um, access to services that reduce impacts from climate change or really um, any service from government or private sector. Speaking of Tony, 
so here's a, the LA Times piece that uh, is up now uh, on their website. Um, and uh, sure, it looks like a lot of work went into this. Uh, had Ros Rosanna Shia from the LA Times was on here a year or two ago with her very innovative work on sea level rise and community response and uh, where they, the LA Times created a game for communities to uh, assess their own exposure. And here, could you just walk us through a little bit here? And then we're going to get to the Columbia package and, and Brian. Sure, Andy. Um, and just one small correction. You, you said we were all white guys and I am Latino. So I just wanted to uh, <laughs> be clear on that. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, just to, if, if you could just kind of scroll down, this is a project sure. that we spent over a year on. We actually conceived of it before the coronavirus pandemic and that, that kind of uh, changed a lot of people's reporting plans for <laughs> the last year plus. Um, but we really got to dig in again this year. And well, you know, I'm I I have for years been the the air quality beat reporter at the LA Times, and you know, from my from my perch there, I was looking at how how rigorously um, you know reporting and research on air quality was, and was seeing a lot of parallels with heat. Um, but it it kind of seemed like you know, though researchers were doing a lot of work on this, it really wasn't resonating yet in journalism. And one of the things we kept running into is when we would have these big heat waves and we would kind of go around and ask the authorities trying to get a sense for, well, what was the human toll, you know, just like you might with a wildfire or a hurricane, you know, and there just weren't a lot of answers. You know, they just, you know, the, the state health department, which in California is responsible for all vital records, you know, deaths, death certificates and the like, they just couldn't say, you know, they, they said, we don't track, we don't do that. Um, and mm -hmm. so, so what we, you know, and and yet, you know, for years, it's it's long been established, you know, in the by scientists that really just kind of going by death certificates and what, you know, if heat happens to be listed on a death certificate is really a vast, you know, really a severe undercount. So we kind of relied on a method that they, uh, you know, that they have um, come up with to to kind of, you know, which I think we're all a lot more familiar with than we would have been even a year ago because of COVID. And this mm -hmm. is kind of the excess mortality. Um, and so that's what right, we did. Right, and, right. and speaking of, you know, kind of collaboration between journalists and scientists, we, we definitely could not have done this without a, a whole, you know, slew of experts that we ran, not only ran this by, but we worked with a health analyst, um, data analyst, um, you know, and even me, you know, even among our journalists, we had different, you know, my colleague, Sean Green is like a total whiz with data and graphics. And he actually did the statistical analysis, but he was constantly, you know, working in consultation with these outside experts. And then once we had our results, we ran them by more people and they said, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? What about narrowing this, you know? And so what we ended up doing was, um, you know, all that collaboration and back and forth informed it. It gave us more confidence that, that these results were valid and also that, um, you know, that we weren't overstating anything. If anything, they're very conservative. We um, limited our uh, examination of, of heat related deaths to just the six months that of the warmest, you know, the six warmest months of the year, which in California, we actually know that there are deaths outside of that time. You know, we have, we have pretty elevated temperatures um, even in December and January that, that have been shown to sure. produce deaths. So, um, yeah, but we did. We tried to be very transparent about all this. We posted our our statistical analysis on GitHub, so anyone can see it. It's it's open for the public right. to see. And um, yeah, we're just trying to, you know, basically to to go over the main finding. We did find that um, if you you know the state's official records only list about 599 people as having died from heat related causes over about the last decade. Uh, that is through 2019. Um, our analysis found it, there's likely at least 3,900, so basically a six-fold increase. And this is this is generally in line with what um, health re researchers have have found in their you know peer-reviewed <laughs> scientific studies of, of past heat waves and past uh, heat events. That that is it, it is a uh, several times you know can be several times um, underreported. So it's kind of validating that, but also mm -hmm. trying to do our our, our um, attempt to, to kind of bring this to light and, and kind of what we brought away from this is that, you know, perhaps the reason that heat waves don't get the attention um, that of other disasters is because of this, because this data gap contributes to the invisibility, you know? 
So we're right. trying to trying to put, push against that a little bit here. Well, and 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 the impacts of heat, right? It, it's sort of a, an elderly person who has pre-existing conditions, and as you said, it doesn't show up in the data automatically. It's just not like a tornado or uh, wildfire, obviously. Or right. One of the experts. One of the experts we talked to talked about giving a a lecture, and um, you know, he said that when you know before and after wildfire, you see the you see the landscape before, and then you see the burned forest and the burned uh, buildings. But uh, the before and after of a heat wave, he just shows a picture of the same city block. It looks exactly the same before and after. It's purely mm -hmm. the human toll, and that's that's harder to find. So a lot of our reporting was also tracking down victims' families through those those deaths that were documented in coroner's records and getting their stories. And a lot of them told us that they felt like their loved ones were basically forgotten, that they were not remembered in the same way that, that people of other disasters would be. So that was very important to us to, to capture that as well. Yeah, we'll circle back to that in, in terms of the sort of what do we do with all this knowledge yeah. uh, toward the end of the show. And, and let's get to the Columbia Project too and, and its partners. Uh, Brian, so how, how does this thing come about? I know Kristen Lombardi of the Journalism School, they have this investigations project. Uh, NPR does a lot of collaborative work across its um, many um, constel its constellation of stations. And and each station now has its own partners like WNYC Gothamist. And I, I, uh, so so how what's the crystallization process that just talk about the project first, just give us like the grand overview and then how how you got involved in how this plays out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, Kristen Lombardi is the head of Columbia Journalism Investigations. And essentially what that is, is that's almost like the closest thing that there is to, you know, Columbia's investigative, you know, newsroom investigative team, essentially. And, uh, you know, each year there's a group of fellows that are hired on and we're kind of digging through different types of stories and we have different grants attached to different types of projects. And the team that I was on was called Hidden Epidemics. And essentially we were searching for hidden climate epidemics that were, you know, striking people but weren't being written about. And I think, you know, what Cascade and Tony already said resonate a lot, you know, with what we were seeking to do with the project and trying to, there's my teammates, uh, Scooty and Julia, but, um, and so what we were trying to do is, yeah, find something that was, you know, affecting people that people weren't talking about essentially. And so right. we had kind of, you know, got onto heat and then we're trying to find different ways to, to quantify heat, much like, uh, Tony had said, and we had settled on going for workers essentially because OSHA has records on worker illnesses and worker deaths. And so we, we had settled on that and, we can get into the, the data a little more, but as kind of things came together, we had, you know, eventually made our database and we knew that we had wanted to do something with audio because I think, you know, we knew that stories about deaths are, you know, oftentimes about the people who are affected by them and the families who are affected, kind of like Tony was saying, and wanted to give a chance to let those people kind of speak directly to people. And so we were seeking out an audio partner and NPR was very gracious and, and jumped on board with us pretty quickly. And you can see Cheryl Thompson there. She is kind of a, a guru at NPR. And all of a sudden she said, you know, we'll do it. And we have somebody in California and we have somebody in Texas. And all of a sudden our team of three had grown to essentially a team of a dozen people at that point with reporters and editors. And we were kind of chopping up our database and seeing, you know, what areas were affected most, what we could do with it. And we settled on California because California does have some laws around heat protections at work and Texas does not have any. So we use them as kind of a compare and contrast. And then throughout our stories, we were also looking into some companies that had several deaths and kind of, you know, what could cause a company to, you know, after one person dies, you know, not fix the issues that are present there. And, you know, then we ended up having about five or six stories that kind of, you know, over time spiraled out from there. And, and let's talk about data too. How did, I know Robbie Parks here also was involved in one of these hidden epidemics projects and it's sort of an environmental epidemiologist and now cascade. So how does, how do those relationships uh, build? Yeah. Yeah. So we, so we had made our kind of database of, of OSHA deaths and it was uh, the three fellows we kind of dug through and sorted through and, and much like they did at the LA times, we were very conservative with our numbers. We excluded a lot of cases that looked like they likely could have been related to heat at work, but just were not clear. And we, you know, didn't have the resources to dig through these thousands of cases, you know, and get all of the files on it. So we really had to kind of 
be conservative about it. But then we wanted to, you know, early on, I think we had the ambitious goal of saying like, okay, let's prove that these cases are because of climate change. I think, you know, as the reporting developed, we had to kind of wind back and be a little more cautious about what we could say, but we um, linked up with Cascade and I can certainly, you know, let him talk about the, the intricacies of that. But I think what we were able to do by linking up with him is, you know, we were able to pull, he was talking about that gridded temperature data. And he said that I was like, oh, that sounds familiar. That's, you know, uh, very much, you know, what we were trying to do is kind of pull temperatures in areas where a lot of these deaths had happened that might be in rural areas, that might be areas with, you know, weather stations that aren't tracking the temperatures as well and see how they compared over time. And what we had found through a lot of our data analysis was that about 50% of our deaths happen on, you know, hotter than average days, essentially, which is kind of a loose term that we were using, but, you know, hotter, hotter than they usually had been. And while we couldn't say that, you know, these deaths were because of climate change, we know that climate change is increasing, you know, the temperature, the average temperatures of days. And so, you know, we could say that, you know, these appear to, you know, like they will increase over time. And then we, you know, check that with, you know, scientists and other researchers who said, yeah, you know, this is tracking with what we're seeing as well. And what's been the response? Uh, yeah, so the we'll response- get, We'll get to the LA Times on this too. Yeah, the response has been, you know, better, I think, than we could have hoped for. I think, you know, we we worked on this for nearly a year, but I think, you know, this summer, uh, with the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of really great, you know, kind of both spot reporting and feature reporting and, you know, enterprise reporting happening on the spot. But Politico wrote a really great story kind of about, you know, heat uh, and workers as well. Our story came out uh, and then the Biden administration not too long ago uh, announced essentially that they were fast tracking worker protections for heat. And as much as, you know, we would love to say that it was our story, I do think it was, you know, there's been a, a specific focus on heat this year because of a lot of the hot temperatures. And, you know, because of all of those, I think there's kind of a just an overwhelming, you know, a bunch of, of news and things that were written that finally pushed some leaders to to take action to protect workers. Yeah, and this gets at um, some aspects of the Biden agenda, too. I did notice uh, here in September, Biden launched a strategy to combat extreme heat. You know, you had the uh, including labor standards. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe also, um, uh, Tony, you could talk a little bit about the reaction so far in California. And you, this isn't the first story you got, you guys have done on this kind of issue. So, uh, what, what's your sense of the reaction so far? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I'll, I'll kind of echo a bit what Brian said that, like, going into this year, I wasn't expecting there to be such a spotlight on extreme heat because I think we both probably had the experience where we felt like this was undercovered. But I think you did see this year, like kind of this, um, I don't know, this like res really response to these exceptional events that we've seen, like in the Pacific Northwest. And I think that really kind of woke a, pe a lot of people up. And I think that, you know, here in California, I think there was a response to that. Um, you know, our story just came out yesterday, so I can't say obviously that uh, our, had that had anything to do with the hearings. Yeah, but but I mean, like we saw in California's budget this year, they devoted more to extreme heat preparedness than they had in the past, some on the order of eight hundred million dollars. Um, you know, is that enough? We we report that it's still a tiny fraction of you know what's devoted to other um, other climate related disasters that are not as deadly. So like, is that something that's gonna change over time? And then all, there's also just a lot of questions about, well, um, you know, some of the government officials we interviewed kind of tried to position this as like, well, you know, we had been kind of chugging along, but then suddenly like extreme heat, like reared its head and like it was coming faster than we thought, but that's not really the case. You know, this has been slowly, you know, this has been happening um, with greater frequency over many years. And, um, you know, for example, one of the things we found in California was that almost a decade ago in, in 2013, the state had done this whole report of listing like something like 48, you know, 40 something odd recommendations. Here are all the things we need to do to prepare for heat waves. They're getting worse with climate change. They're gonna be more deadly. And they they really had, you know, eight years later, they had followed little of their own advice. So, so they tell us now that they're going to do another report, you know, another strategy but this time they're going to put money behind it. So it's kind of like, well, we'll wait and see, you know, see if that happens. We, we did find that California is, is lagging behind other states, um, you know, and municipalities in the way they monitor and respond to heat, you know, 
other countries, yeah. um, France, you know, Arizona, New York City, are some of the places we talk about as as being ahead of the curve on this. And um, so I think there's kind of a sense that like California presents itself as a climate leader, but on this, it's not really that's not really the case. So are they going to catch up? We'll, we'll see. You know. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned France because uh, you, you know I hadn't thought about this until just now. They had their uh, tr- epic heat disaster in 2003-ish where several tens of thousands of excess deaths, mostly people's grandparents unattended and air conditioned, uh, you know, apartments in the, in the summer vacation. And that, that, you know, it reminds me of, and I hadn't thought about this just now, you know, in 1953, the Netherlands had their great flood disaster that prompted this mega response. You know, the Netherlands is one of the most vulnerable countries for flooding, but they, they created a uh, huge programs and investments in infrastructure because of that shock of that event. And France had its heat event, but the United States is weird. I think I wrote about this at the times. I got to find this piece way back. It was probably 15 years ago, a little thumb sucker for the weekend review section on how our country doesn't have one climate. You know, the West is is scorching and dry. The East is wet and getting wetter. And so there's no common sense of climate here. So that's why, at least at that scale, it's been hard to see how we get traction. I don't know. I don't know if that resonates for, for any of you. A cascade, when you think about the gap between scientific information and what, what people are doing about it, uh, you know, what comes to mind? Oh, I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, so the one thing I'm glad you brought up the European heat wave, um, because from what I understand it across Europe, uh, there were 70,000 excess deaths. Um, but in subsequent heat waves, people haven't been dying at the same rate. So what gives me hope, um, is that we do have the capacity to adapt and to move people out of harm's way. Um, But what's really important to me when I think about this um, is if you think of the notion of food deserts, um, there's a great piece in Vice News um, a week ago about food deserts and the notion that, oh, the response was we have to build grocery stores. That doesn't solve the problem because it doesn't create access to food. It's the same thing with cooling centers. Um, I mean, shade structures, green space are more ubiquitous, but to me, policy and making sure those policies are enforced, especially for those who are marginalized, is how you reduce the impacts of extreme heat. And that's why Tony's work and Brian's work, I mean, those personal stories, that's that's what humans love. We love stories. Our, our whole economy is built around stories um, and telling those stories of the individuals. Um, and now as the world becomes more data literate um, and data-driven journalists, journalism. I mean, that's how you uh, really build amazing collaborations like this. Um, sorry if that is a little bit rambling. No, no, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a ramble that we all have to think about because um, this dates back to the work of Eric Kleinenberg as well after the great Chicago heat wave, um, the mid 90s, where he found that communities with more awareness more connectedness, more social cohesion had far lower death rates when that heat wave struck. And that's something that we can all do something about. You know, that's what encourages me too, just as you were saying, you know, I've been writing about climate change, the grand question of climate change, you know, since the eighties, people have seen this, my, my 1988 cover story on global, on global warming. You know, and the last thing we need, I think is more of that, which is sort of weird. The more, because you can get progress on these issues. Same thing applies to the pandemic, of course, is, you, you know, actually local and community response is a huge part of whether that risk goes away or not. Um, there was a guy, v- Vivek um, Shandas in Portland, at Portland State, who was on the show in June, showed this mapping tool. And, and maybe this is, we could talk to the journalists about this too, um, where that he's developed for uh, that city, uh, showing what their futures could look like in terms of heat. Um, depending on local situations. I'm just including this. I think I have a link here to um, the live website. Let me just see if this works. It's sort of an envisioning tool for communities to say, oh, you know, my block actually in 30 years will be either a lot more 
a lot hotter or, or not not hotter, depending on our local uh, decisions related to impervious surface or uh, trees and the like. And this tool is journalism more and more can get into this form of story. So it's not just storytelling. It's it's something different. I don't know what, you, what label you'd put on it. And Tony, this reminds me of Rosanna's work on sea level too, where you're you're essentially the journalists can help communities envision the thing that journalism doesn't get at, which is the future. <laughs> how do how do we? And I don't know whether this is something the LA Times is actually you know working on more. Um, again, I was impressed by that sea level project, and here I am impressed by what uh, Vivek did in Portland at Portland State. Although he did say this took like a year of computer <laughs> computer time and a, a million dollars just for that one city. So, so Tony, what, what are you guys working on as you think about this kind of question going forward? Yeah, are, you, are you moving to the editorial board? Did I see? Uh, yeah, this is my last uh, project before I move uh, change jobs. So I'm staying at the LA Times, but we'll be writing on climate, climate and environment yeah. for opinion. So um, great. Yeah, but I'll just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I. We did include some projections in our story. Um, it's, but but I would also say that, especially on the the heat and the tree canopy, you know, the kind of the green space, it's even compelling these these same images for today because we're kind of looking when you look at these same images for today of the temperature gradients and the 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 vast disparities in tree cover and green space. That's already a legacy of decisions that were made decades ago. Um, urban right. planning decisions, redlining, and then of course the decision to, um, you know, uh, pollute the atmosphere with uh, CO2, you know, like in terms of magnifying and rise, raising that risk. So like, I think that, um, you know, we have, a, we actually have a couple more stories coming out on this topic over in the coming days. And one of them will get into this, that idea, kind of the build environment as a magnifying glass for this threat. And like with so many other climate impacts, it's not as simple as just, you know, it's not spread around evenly. It's not as simple as, um, okay, it's, the temperature has risen by two degrees and we're all two degrees hotter. It's much more uh, unequal than that. And so I think that's that's one of the ways this threat in particular heat is so insidious because of the, it's the way it perpetuates that, that sort of inequality. Yeah, that, um, this came out also in Portland. Uh, I haven't written about it, but I did some, a lot yeah. of tweeting of coverage there that found as they did their postmortem on who died, it was elderly people living in unair conditioned mobile homes, for example. And, and those are very granular things. And of course, anyone with air conditioning has a very different outcome. And that all right. relates to, um, community and uh, the the stark divides among us. Yeah, one of the things we did in our project was we actually requested, you know, I think six years of coroner's reports from across California. There's 58 counties in California. So there's a lot of records. But one thing that I came away from that process understanding is that um, even though, you know, the elderly, the infirm may be the, the most at risk, it, everyone has some risk, you know, there, there are records and cases of, you know, a healthy person in their forties or fifties went out in a jog. It was 90 degrees, you know, not something you would think of. They, they were a related death. You know, there were young children, um, high school kids playing football. You know, I, I right. think that, um, you know, there's just so many examples of um, as much as you try to classify it as like, Oh, these are the most vulnerable everyone to some degree is at risk. And I don't think people are necessarily aware of that or they don't think of it that way. Um, they don't think of heat as being the immediate threat to their lives that it can. Yeah, so Brian, on this front too, um, your you, your project has revealed these hidden, hidden epidemics essentially. And how far forward can you drive that work toward what's called solutions journalism, which a lot of newsrooms still don't. You know, I, I love my friends in the solutions journalism network. I've, I've worked with them a couple of times, but it still feels like such an outlier when you think of the how newsrooms think, how we approach the job. I can tell you some war stories at the New York Times that, you, you know, like when an editor says, isn't that a little ahead of the news? Meaning writing about something that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> You just want to kind of anyway tear your hair. So 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 what's possible there from your standpoint? Yeah, I think the nice part about you know what we had worked on and you know we talked a lot about 
solutions during it and you know whether there were solutions and i say the nice part about it but i guess is maybe you know the the cynical part about it as well as they're like there is stuff that can be done i don't think that it needs to be all that forward looking i think cascade already hit on one point briefly when he was talking and that like you know there are you know populations that you know there are rules there are governmental bodies that can help protect I, this story in particular that i done with my reporting partner jacob i mean we you know talk to a lot of people at cal ocean you know they they're an underfunded agency have been for years understaffed and you know just cannot even get to investigating or adequately investing the cases <laughs> you know i I, I believe we did a very thorough job, but we certainly didn't canvas every single, you know, death that there was. And we found cases that appeared to not be investigated very well, you know, so there are like very simple, you know, solutions in, in that realm for, you know, just making sure that, you know, even though, you know, it is a tragedy that they're still happening, but at least when there are tragedies that we're properly looking into them and then taking steps to, to remedy those things. But, but there are, I think, so we had another story that had come out and I think this, hits on what Tony said, which I think is a great point, is like, heat is definitely affecting everybody. The second California story that we had come out was about firefighters dying during training from the heat. So not when they're out fighting fires, you know, there's no increased temperatures because of that, but just when they're training. And I mean, I think when people think about firefighters, they are not thinking about like elderly infirm people, they're thinking about, you know, fit people yeah. who are working out all the time, who certainly wouldn't be affected by the heat, but you know, we found a, a, a large number of them who had been injured and, and some who had died. And and again, on that front, uh, you know, when we were looking into things and we had uh, somebody with Public Health Watch, who was another one of our partners, do a, a solutions esque story um, about heat. And what we had found is the Army, you know, very similar to to Cal Fire in California, kind of a paramilitary type organization. They they have pretty much eliminated heat deaths from, you know, their ranks when they're training. And there are solutions for a lot of these heat issues. And I think that was something we were frustrated about, but, you know, we're glad that we didn't have to kind of get into that heady discussion of like, oh, this might work, this could work, because there are a lot of different solutions to dealing with heat that that people just need to be committed to do. And uh, I think another point that Tony had hit on was great, was that like, we saw it in California, we've seen it in the country too, is like, it's great to talk about wanting to have heat solutions, but putting money and putting resources and then actually, you know, making sure that those, you know, the people who are working on it are trying to solve some of these issues is the key because you can, you know, talk about it as much as you'd like. And it's nice, I think, for politicians to talk about it. And I think that's what we've even thought with the Biden administration's announcement is like excited to see, you know, where the rubber meets the road because it's great to hear that there's going to be protections, but if they don't enforce them, the issues are still going to persist. Yeah. Uh one of the things that binds everybody here is the data part, uh, finding these impacts in the data. Um, and I want to circle to something Tony just mentioned earlier. You, you know, you had worked on air quality uh, substantially uh, when I was at the LA Times briefly in the mid 1980s. I was there for just one year. We'll tell you about that sometime. Um, obviously, smog and, and fire impacts uh, the 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 uh, that that all is a big deal, but it's also, again, one of these areas where the impacts are kind of in the data. It's very foggy. It's very hazy and it doesn't present well at a hearing. You know, again, the, the drownings in, in New York City basements and Hurricane Ida's remnants were, you know, specific discrete events. And, and, and I, 10 years ago, I did a piece about for the, my blog at the Times on um, where a health, a high level, oh yeah, it was Bob Perciuseppe who had been at EPA for a long time. He said, you know, you go to a Senate hearing and you just present this data and they say, well, where are the bodies? This keeps coming up. And um, I don't know if you feel ultimately they were finally, it looks like maybe a threshold has been hit where this might make a difference. Again, we can't say, Tony, for your own, for this story you just came out with you guys, but do you feel there is a sea change here? Are people actually finally getting it? Yeah, that's it, it does have a lot of parallels. And, you know, in the same way, you're not going to find um, smog or air pollution on any death certificates, even in L.A., even when it was really bad. So the but I think this concept of environmental hazards of temperature, dirty air, pushing people over the edge is something that 
maybe through the experience of these really, really excessive heat waves, people are going to try to start to understand. Now, I think in California, it's we've been dealing with smog for so long that there probably is more awareness of that and kind of just the, the common sense idea that like, man, I'm breathing this stuff over many years and years, that's I'm probably going to die early, you know, but that literally is what what is happening shortened lives. Um, it's, you know, so I think that like, like with a lot of climate change impacts, it's like, the more direct experience people have with it, the more they, they kind of start to wrap their head around it. But but I do agree it is like a, uh, it is a limitation because it's not visual. It's not, um, it, like you said, it is a bit foggy. Uh, it is a little hard to to nail down as easily. And I think that's part of the reason that it, it's taken so long for there to be much momentum on this issue. And the, rem and the remedies are also not like ribbon cutting things. Right. Yeah. There's someone told us in our reporting that, that there's not really like a lobby, like pro cooling, pro, heat, you know, anti, anti heat lobby in the same way. And there's really not even like a structure within government. We have like in California, we've got like these huge government institutions, air resources board. It's like over a thousand people just working on air pollution. It's like there's not even anything like that for heat. So, you know, I'm not, I don't know if that's the solution to build up a whole government bureaucracy, but it just kind of shows you how it's not even formulated as the same kind of threat. Um, Cascade, your project is global and we haven't really brought in the global picture here yet. Um, so let's just circle back there before we conclude uh, and, and we'll conclude with a couple of sort of action ideas. Uh, yeah. Taking this, um, oh, so what do you think about when you think about DACA or or uh, Legos and uh, these questions? So, um, I think what unites the three stories, you know, my paper in PNAS, the excellent work by Columbia Journalism School and NPR, and Tony's great story that came out in the LA Times, is that all this work is retrospective. This is a lived experience for what my work shows, almost 2 billion people on the planet this has already happened. Um, so while the heat waves in the Northwest were um, horrific, honestly, um, that is a new experience for people in those cities. Um, and so in terms of, you know, DACA or Lagos or the cities that have had this, um, I don't want to say exponential, but in some, some cities, actual exponential change in um, heat exposure, um, I think there's actually a lot of opportunity there to learn from bottom up. Like I provide a global map of where these processes are and all those cities have done different things from the individual to the community um, to adapt already. And I think pinpointing areas that might have similar climate, similar demographic trends in totally different countries with totally different policies, that's how you can create an exchange of information. Um, and then the second thing is that the solution space, especially in terms of infrastructure, and this is where I come back to policy. I think the policies can be pretty ubiquitous, but infrastructure is going to be really different. You might not want to green up a city in the tropics because what our paper really looks at is the combined effects of humidity and temperature. And you might not want to add more green space or more water to an already very humid area. Um, similarly, building shade structures in the tropics might not do anything because it's already all generally fairly cloudy at zero degrees latitude. So um, I could, Again, the solution space, I think, really needs to be targeted and bottom up. Um, and the thing that, that gives me hope is we don't need to invent a technology that hasn't, we're not like banking on something like carbon capture or something that hasn't been proven. All this stuff is in our hands. We uh, just need to finance it and use it. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is there's um, a great paper by, um, Lad Keith or Keith Lad, I'm not uh, at Arizona that just came out on policy. Um, and I think it's in, uh, it looks like it's in nature. Um, and it just came out yesterday or the day before kind of outlining what we need. Um, and then similarly, there's a paper in nature climate change that said in the official heat record in sub-Saharan Africa, there are two heat waves um, since 1900. And so in terms of mortality, I mean, I don't think we'll ever really know. Um, hmm. And the last point I'll make, at least for the North American context, that I think is really cool space for innovation is actually attaching meteorological records to health records. 
which I think is a very technologically feasible. Somebody comes into a hospital, we could probably even do it retrospectively. I mean, that's what we did for the story, Brian. Um, so then we know what was the PM 2.5, what was the temperature, what was the humidity on that day, um, and then how oh, does that's that compare, interesting. Just so it's how part does that of the record. The record. Yep. Normalizing that becoming part of uh, the data that are collected. That sounds pretty promising. Uh, so let's let's just spend a few more minutes on what are some opportunities, whether whether it includes something we can talk about or bring some other people in to talk about in a few further show, or uh, you know another kind of collaboration. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, Tony, related to um, your other arena, air quality, was um, digging in more on smoke. Um, there, there was a paper, I, I just tweeted this while we were talking, uh, estimated global mortality attributable to smoke from landscape fires. This is a 2012 paper. And the idea, I think it's pretty clear cut that there are more deaths. If you go into the same statistical arena, there are more deaths from wildfire smoke than there are from wildfire fire. But we haven't really, some, I think you guys have probably had a story or two on that, but does that help to broaden the landscape of, understanding if we got into that more as journalists? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I don't think that really became very apparent to a lot of journalists until the last few years where we've just had these incredible smoke impacts that have spanned the entire country, you know, from Western wildfires. Um, the idea that that there's many more people impacted by the, the smoke from the wildfire than, than are in like direct harm's way of, you know, their property or their community burning, um, you know, there, there have been some estimates of, you know, some of the large wildfires, the mortality um, effects, uh, you know, in California of, of the smoke and absolutely higher than, than, than direct deaths from the, the flames. So I think, I think that that's, that's a huge, um, it's a huge change in how we understand air quality, where like the, the model and, and all the clean air laws really are based, the Clean Air Act is really based on these you know, tailpipe and industrial pollutants, um, smog, which has largely gotten better over time. And then you've got kind of this new rising threat that's really displacing and undermining a lot of that, um, those, that progress in, in a lot of ways. So I think that's like a huge avenue for more reporting and just helping people understand the risks of not just, not just like a momentary day or two of uh, exposure to smoke, but, um, you know, episodes like smoke sieges essentially smoke waves that, that go on for days or even weeks and, and what are the health impacts of that we're still there's a lot of research into that and we're still like learning smoke waves there you go i think you're right by the way the other thing i've written about is um and you you guys have written enormously about this uh, bettina boxall and everybody for a long time that uh there's been a fire drought for 100 years essentially in big chunks of the West. And what people don't quite recognize, I'm writing something about this now, is there's also been a smoke drought that where there where there isn't fire, there hasn't been smoke. And so what's come back is is kind of a norm. It, and there's much to talk about in terms of prescribed fire in California and how this air, clean air laws as they exist now can actually impede doing some of the burning that has to be done to make California safer and burn less overall or at least have less bad smoke. Interesting frontiers here going forward. You all have been, uh, it's been great for you to be able to come on uh, for this thrown together uh, show. And I wondered if you had just a last uh, thought, uh, Brian too, you know, what's coming on, on your radar there? What what can I do to help? <laughs> or what, what can be done to broaden uh, the impact or the uh, collaborations that are needed here? Yeah. Um... It's a good question. And yeah, I think, you know, this is certainly something that planning to keep working on with my reporting partner, Jacob, we've got a couple more stories in the, the pipeline here, hopefully. Um, but I mean, I think the, the key is, and I think, you know, this type of thing and, you know, these types of collaborations, you know, kind of are the, the way that I think we'll kind of keep discussions like this in the forefront. And I think, you know, something that we've all been kind of hitting on throughout this and kind of what was really driven home for me throughout the project is just like, you know, it is these individual stories of people being affected by this that are really, I think, driving change and are what resonates with people who maybe don't necessarily see 
the immediate effects in their lives. And so kind of just the, the encouraging and, and fostering of those, you know, I think is what's going to keep driving this conversation forward because it, it, it is important to talk about, you know, the disastrous large scale effects, but I think that has a, an effect of stepping things back so far that some people can just kind of, kind of not pay attention to it. But when they see, you know, that their neighbors or colleagues or even, you know, fellow states people are, are dying from these issues or getting injured from them that, you know, drives it home a little, a little closer to home. And, and Cascade, just uh, briefly, you know, we've got these examples now of scientists working collaboratively with journalists. Um, I think the upside dominates quite the downside. You, you know, there are all these questions about peer review and the like. But Tony, as Tony explained, and Abram Lesgarten, who was on here last year talking about his migration package, did something similar with uh, at ProPublica with uh, migration models and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can be done to facilitate more of the crosstalk that might lead to these kinds of projects? I think projects exactly like the one that I was in, fortunate enough to be invited on to, to really just be um, a consultant to run data ideas back and forth to say, you know, can, does the data tell this? Um, and then this is, much more broader, but I think um, the basic education in science and media literacy, starting you know when children are really young, because our media landscape has changed, it has exploded. It's way different than five years ago, even, and that's really important to me is to get get science and media literacy into schools, um, and I think that's much bigger. But yeah. I'm showing an example that I really love, uh, Climate Central, which has been around for more than a decade. It, it's sort of at the interface of media and science, has been doing some pretty great graphics. You, you know, it's still early days to know when a graphic actually changes somebody. But this one shows you that a, a little change in the global climate can end up creating that much bigger red zone, you know, the, these danger zones. And the other science that's so important here, as your paper this week points out is that exposure and vulnerability are driving a red zone of risk for humanity that can be worked on really, you know, looking at the divides among us, whether it's someone down the block, you know, a homeless person in LA who's exposed to heat or the person in the air conditioned apartment uh, upstairs from there, completely different experiences as this, these changes play out. So you've all made me uh, hopeful, more hopeful that um, we're heading in the right direction. But so again, just a reprise, 1988, there, there's my story on Endless Summer for uh, Discover Magazine uh, 2021. We have uh, great meteorologists like Jeff Baradelli who are uh, also becoming communicators of climate change and, and risk and solutions. And so what do we do for 2088? You're all on a good path for that. And the organizations you're working with are are really at the forefront, uh, whether it's CSUN, Columbia Climate School, or the LA Times Newsroom, which has been doing pioneering work for a while, or uh, the collaborations that Brian is involved with through the Journalism School and NPR and all of its uh, iterations. So thanks for being part of this show today. I wish you well through the weekend and on through the rest of the century. <laughs> Come back on if you can. Uh, you know, Tony, maybe we'll get Anna, Anna Phillips back on here sometimes too. And um, what a, what a great uh, team you've got there in LA. Uh, and um, thank you for doing this. And we will do it again if we can. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, really.